Father in heaven, I, I thank you for Jesus. No man ever spoke like this man. To whom shall we go? He has the words of eternal life. And so we really want to listen. We want to hear Jesus. And we believe that these four gospels are the voice of Christ, both by virtue of what they record and by virtue of their inspiration. So we are about to walk among glorious words. So come, give us ears to hear, give me faithfulness to what the scriptures say, and may the voice of Jesus be heard. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. May that happen, I pray now. In Jesus' great name, amen. What Jesus Demands from the World is the name of a book I wrote seven years ago. That's one of the reasons this uh, workshop is called What Jesus Demands from the World. And I want to say something about the book because it has to do with the DVD that was then just done, which I don't know where, where it's available yet, um, and how it came to be and then how it affects what I'm going to do now. So in 2000. Six, I went to Cambridge and spent five months at Tyndale House, four of which were working on this. And here's, here's what was driving me in those days. Why, why did I write this? Nobody asked me to write this book. And uh, it doesn't sell a lot of copies, as far as I know. Um, but I, love, I loved what I did there. I'm, I was driven by two things. When I was a doctoral student at the University of Munich, 1971 to 74, totally immersed in high-level German critical theory about synoptic issues and Johannine issues, in the air in those days was the tension between Jesus and Paul. The, the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history. Paul invented Christianity. Jesus brought the kingdom. And they do not mix. This is, you can hear, just mega unbelieving approach to the Bible, which was and in some places still is fairly typical. I was living in that. I was working in that. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on um, Jesus' love command from the Synoptic Gospels, early Christian paranesis, they called it. I would have never used that word, but that was what I was told to use, which means early ethical teaching. <clears throat> and I came out of that saying, someday, I want to write a book called Jesus and Paul to show they are one. They're one. One vision of God, one way of salvation, one ethical plan, just one in the deepest ways. This is kind of that book because I said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read straight through all four Gospels at, at my little study cubicle there in Cambridge, and I'm going to write down every time I see an imperative, demand, what Jesus demands, write down every imperative. I've got about 500 of them, okay, on stacks of paper. This is how books come into being. So you got 500 imperatives or implied imperatives. And then I stepped back and said, wow, how am I going to make sense out of that? And I got it all organized and said, okay, I'm going I'm to put it in 50 chapters so people can read one a week, every chapter averaging about seven pages. You could do one page a day if it feels like heavy sledding. And that's the way it might be used. But my goal was handle Jesus so limitedly, that is, don't let Paul talk, that if it starts sounding Pauline, that's because it is, because Jesus is Pauline. 
I'm not, it's not sounding that way because I'm importing Paul. So just before I came up here or down here from my room, I counted the number of pages for the index here. There's 11, 11 pages of scripture index with about 94 lines, which means more than one per line. So we get over a thousand Bible references in the index. And right there at the end is 1 Corinthians with two. Paul, the writings outside the gospels are referred to twice out of 1,000. So that, I, that was totally intentional. I do not quote anything but gospels here, except for those two, and that was just to define the Lord's Supper and what it, what it became. And my goal was, if I can handle the gospels in a way that's faithful to the gospels as they stand, and it starts to sound like Christianity, not just this preliminary kingdom came, doesn't have anything to do with Christianity, then that would serve the unity of the New Testament. That was my, my hidden scholarly agenda. Pr practically, it was driven like this. How does Matthew end? So between the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension, which is where we live right now in the church year, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the earth. And I have always taken a deep breath when I have heard teaching them to observe all I commanded you, what Jesus demands. So I said, okay, do missionaries do that? Do pastors do that? Do pastors get up in the morning, do missionaries get up in the morning and say, my job is to teach the church everything he commanded. And, and my answer is yes. And I'm, I'm supposed to be a servant of the church, a helper. So I said, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to know all the commands. I want to systemize them, systematize them into some kind of order. I want to group them because I don't want to write a chapter on does I mean, hundreds and hundreds of commands. That's the other agenda here, helping pastors and missionaries obey the second half of the Great Commission. Now, here's the catch. It does not say in Matthew 28, 19, teaching them all that I commanded you. What word did I leave out? Observe teaching them to observe, keep in the Greek, keep. What's the difference? <laughs> like light and day? You can teach the devil and unbelievers in university classes all that he taught. They can memorize it and stay unbelievers. But how do you teach people to observe? That means do it, which posed the question for me, okay, I'm writing a book to help that sentence happen. I'm doing a seminar workshop right now to help that happen for you. How do you do that? What kind of teaching? Because Jesus said teach, teach them in such a way that they actually do it. Wow. Easy to teach facts, right? It's so easy to teach facts. Make a list, memorize the facts, study their relationship, got the facts, go to hell. <laughs> but, to, but to teach the, the facts, the commands in such a way that something happens in heart and mind that people will lay their life down the way Jesus said, we'll have to lay our life down. That's a miracle. And I, I tried to think that through. 
So what we're going to do in whatever time, we'll just go and then we'll stop because I don't know. Um, oh, this, this explains why I said that. We'll go until we stop. So life way, uh, phoned us up and said, we want to, we want to do a, a DVD on, on, uh, what Jesus demands from the world. I said, well, how, how do you want to do that? Well, we'll just pick, um, six clusters of commands and we'll come to Minneapolis and sit you in front of a camera and you talk about them for 10 minutes each. And that's what this is. And then Brian Tab wrote up a little study guide to go with it. So this is that distilled into one thing. <laughs> that's what it is. So I, w- what you would see here in six videos, I'm going to try to pack in. Whether we get through all six, I don't really care because really it's illustrative of, of the question is, how do you teach all things to the nation so that they observe them? That is, do them. What kind of approach would you have? That's where we're going. Evidently, Jesus intended to teach in a way very different from the Pharisees. Remember how he scolded them at the beginning of Matthew 23? He said, you load people with burdens too hard to bear and do not lift one of your fingers to help them. That's bad teaching. Evidently, Jesus thought he was going to do it differently from that. So what's the difference between his loading us with burden, I mean, dozens and dozens of commands in the Gospels and not lifting a finger to help us? What's the difference? Where would you, what text would you go to to describe the difference? If we were doing the seminar here, I'd, anybody want to shout it out? I go to Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Oh, everyone who thirsts. No, that's Isaiah. <laughs> Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He knew he's talking to. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Now that's heavy. Ever seen yokes on oxen? Big, heavy. Take my yoke upon you and learn. We're talking knowledge and commands here. Learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is really and my burden is unbelievable. You ever read the Gospels? Whoever would follow me must take up his cross. That's horrible. Crosses are horrible. They're almost unwatchable when you watch them on television. When Jesus gets crucified in the New Bible AD, which showed last Sunday week ago. What in the world did he mean? My commands are light. My commands are easy. Surely in that little text, the answer is, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. I preached on this text one time ages ago, back in the early 80s, I think. And I, before I gave this little illustration, I said to the folks, I want somebody to draw this for me or paint this for me and give me something for my wall. I said, here's my picture. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So I'm the oxen, all right? The oxen right here. I'm going to pull a plow and the plow is going to pull through heavy, hard soil. That's hard work for an oxen to pull because this plow is digging into soil. That's what pastoral work is, it's plowing and trying to make soil good. And, and so he's going to put his yoke on me, teach them all things, 
And then he's going to take hold of the, that plow handles like this. <laughs> and it's kind of like, oh, what was, what's that cartoon character who always ate spinach? Popeye. Okay, you remember what Popeye's arms looked like? They look ridiculous. They look like balloons. That's another generation, sorry. So you got, you got Jesus with Popeye arms on the on the handles of the plow with me, John Piper, the ox, and his yoke on my back, and Jesus goes like this and lifts me off the ground. I'm like dangling. Like this. An ox weighs two tons and he's dangling in the air. And Jesus pushes the plow through. Like I'm just going, this is great. Something like that. I mean, what would your picture be? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light because you've come to me. So I thought if, if that's the key, if the key to doing all that he commanded is coming to him, I'm going to make sure that at the front of the book are all the commands like that. Come, come. And there are a lot of them. Uh, we'll start, number one, with you must be born again. I think that's the most basic commandment in the New Testament, in the Gospels. You must be born again. Before any of your obedience efforts, are morally worthy and acceptable, and yes, you can please God, but not before you're born again. So being born again, and then there's the command, come to me, there's the command, believe on me, there's the command, love me, there's the command, abide in me. So now we got the first six chapters of the book, and you haven't heard, do anything. Because the coming is not a geographical motion, right? If I said to you right now, come to Jesus, you shouldn't stand up. You shouldn't move one muscle. So no muscles are being moved in these first six commands. Be born, repent, come, believe, love, abide. You haven't moved a muscle. You've just been totally changed. And that's the way it all starts which is going to sound very Pauline. It's going to sound like Ephesians 2. The great love with which he loved us, he made us alive in Christ Jesus. It's going to sound like that because it is like that. So let's talk about new birth for starters here. Um, John 3, 7. And I, I mean, he, methodologically, if you were a scholar, you'd say, oh, right off the bat, this is irresponsible because he's mis mixing it up with John and the synoptics. That's, yeah, of course I am. I am totally mixing it up with John and the synoptics. I'm going everywhere in the Gospels, beginning to end, and dumping it all out without any distinction about who wrote what. That is a methodological commitment on my part that has very solid roots. I have this conviction. I've watched a lot of scholarship of the last 60 years say, uh, present Jesus. I read a book called Jesus for Atheisten, Jesus for Atheists in German, Jesus for Marxists, and so on. They are all based on layering and peeling away layers of gospel tradition, finding the pieces that they think are more rudimentary and basic, the real Jesus. And guess what? They change every generation. Every generation produces a new Jesus for that generation based on responsible historical scholarship, to which I say, baloney. I think what will last is if you take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them, as they stand, understand each of them in his particular context, systematize them without distorting anything, you will have a truer picture of Jesus than any other kind of historical approach. That's my conviction. Okay, so yes, we're starting in John 3. Do not marvel, Nicodemus, at this, that I say you must be born again, chapter 3, verse 7, 
Verse three, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Or verse five, cannot enter the kingdom of God. So what does that mean? That's a command. You must, duty must, you must be born again. So what Jesus demands from the world, the world must be born again. What does it mean? Verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So to be born again means to be born of the spirit. Hmm, what does that mean? What does that mean? Be born of the spirit. Verse eight, the wind blows where it wills. You know, wind and spirit, same word. The spirit, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it but you don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That sounds like the Spirit is free. He does this wherever He pleases. It happens. We don't know where it came from. That's, whoa, what is that? I now love Him. Yesterday I didn't. Why? You have been born again. So the Spirit blows where He wills. So the new birth is something God does to us and it's a command that we must experience it. Troubling, Pauline, sovereignty, reformed, that sort of stuff. Yeah, it is. It's it's not unique to John. Luke 9, 60, Jesus said to the man who wanted to follow him and go bury his dead, let the dead bury their dead. There are living dead and dead dead. Let the dead bury their dead. Who are the dead? Everybody that's not been made alive. That's John 9, 60. Here's Luke 15, 24, parable of the prodigal son to the older brother, mm, breaking his dad's heart a second time. Are you throwing a party for him? You never threw a party for me. I've served you like a slave all my life and you don't ever throw a party for me. And the father looks at him, the Pharisee, and says, this my son was dead and he's alive. That's Luke. This is not unique to John. It's not unique to Jesus. Paul has it. Paul got it from Jesus. So we must be born again. Or John 1, 12, to all, he came to his own. His own did not receive him, but to as many as received him, Now, there you're involved, right? That's your will and your action, your choice. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, comma, to all who were born of God, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so exegetically, you have to ask Okay, authority to become children of God through receiving Jesus, being born not of the will of man. Hmm. And I think, given what Jesus said in John 3, the right way to put those two together are the the birth, not through the will of man, but the will of God, enables the receiving of the Messiah through which we are children of God. Now, I didn't do this in the book, but I'll do it here. Is that confirmed anywhere in the epistles? And it is, 1 Peter 1, 23. We have been born again, not through perishable seed, but through through the living and abiding Word of God. Verse 25, this Word is the gospel which was preached to you. So the new birth, while it is a work of God sovereignly in me, blowing by the Spirit wherever He pleases, my experience of it is my eyes are open This is Jesus. This is Son of God. This is Messiah. This is everything I've been waiting for. I receive you. I welcome you into my life. That's how we experience the new birth. We didn't make that happen. 
In fact, he, just he, I don't, I'm sure everybody here is not, you know, technically and all on board with Reformed theology, five points, all that stuff. But when I talk to ordinary folks, you know how I, the litmus paper that I use just to see where they are, I say, just tell me how God saved you. And, and there's always two ways to answer that. One is historically Christ died for me, and the other is experientially my mom talked to me. My pastor preached, Billy Graham was on the radio, or something, some kind of human present experience and past historical thing. And I want to know this. I want them to tell me, how did it happen? Every born again person loves to give God credit for that, don't they? I mean, I've never heard anybody say, I was smarter than my lost sibling who hasn't yet, or I was more anything. I was more lost is what I was, and I was just hating Jesus, thinking he's boring, partying. And one of those weird guys with Campus Crusade or Campus Outreach or InterVarsity or Navigators or Reform Fellowship, what, they, they just came up to me one day and they asked me about Jesus, and that night, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it. I opened the Bible my mom sent with me. I hadn't looked at it for a year. I started reading. I'm a new person this morning. What's that? God showed up. The Spirit blew, and He has been born of God. Outside the Gospels, here's the clearest statement of how faith and new birth relate to each other. First John 5, 1. Everyone who believes, there's faith, that's what you do. God doesn't do that for you, in place of you. You do that. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Not will be born of God, has been born of God. John Stott in his little commentary says this just settles it for him that new birth precedes and empowers and enables my faith. So if you've ever embraced Jesus, received Jesus, believed in Jesus, it's because he caused you to be born again. Otherwise, you'd be dead. You'd be spiritually un uninterested. So Jesus' first most fundamental command is you must become alive. Without life given by the Holy Spirit, all of my commands will turn you into classic Pharisees or rebels. Those are the two options. Without the new birth, a command comes and you can either say, I can do this. I can do this and I will do it and God will like me for it. Or I hate this. I'm never, that's the weirdest lifestyle I've ever seen. No way. Those are your two options. But with the new birth, you're dangling. You, you are inhabited by supernatural power that is causing you to love a person so much that, like Tim Keller said, your duty has become your pleasure or your joy. That's number one. Command number two. First one, be, be born again. Command number two, love God. Love me. Jesus talking. Love Jesus and love God. So I'm thinking of the great commandment. Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So I'm, I'm skipping over the command to come, believe, abide, and I'm going now to love. Just, just picking the six that they picked for me when I did the DVD. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. So that's clearly one of the things Jesus demands from the world. Everybody in the world must love God with all our heart. And not only the Father, but Matthew 10, 37. Whoever loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, there's no imperative there, but I use that because it's clearly implied, right? If you don't 
love me more than you love your mom and your dad and your children, you're not worthy of me. You can't have me. So we have love God with all your heart. We have love Jesus more than mom and dad and your children, or you're not going to be with him forever. So I, I asked a bunch of questions about those commands. What's the relationship between those two? Love God, love Jesus. What's the nature of the love, what it's like? Uh, where did it come from? How does it, how does it happen in your life? And how important is it? Those are my four questions. Let's take them one at a time. The first question about how they're related is totally relevant for, for Islam and Muslim evangelism, right? Because Muslims don't love Jesus as the crucified and risen Son of God who died for their sins, rose again, reigns in heaven today, will come and rule the world someday as the crucified one with holes in his hands. They don't think he was crucified. The Jesus we have in our Gospels is not Esau, the Jesus of the Quran. This is a distorted book. All the original stories about Jesus which are true have been lost. I just, this is street talk in my town. I mean, he, I'm surrounded by Muslims in my neighborhood, mainly from Somalia. This is street apologetics for Muslims. You Christians don't have the original book. It's been lost. Now, there's no historical evidence for that whatsoever. Bart Ehrman would say there's no historical for that whatsoever, and he doesn't even think we got the text right as they stand. So, when you talk to a Muslim, and I, I was on a panel one time on this, and he, these are the texts I used. John 8, 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, he's saying this to the Pharisees, if God were your father, you would love me. Get the connection? If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded and came from God. So if you don't believe that he proceeded and came from God and love him as the Son of God who was sent into the world, before Abraham was, I am, I and the Father are one. If you don't love that, you, how does it say? You don't have God as your father. Number two, John 5, 42. But I know that you, to the Pharisees again, do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. So how do I know you don't have love for God? You don't receive me. I am the litmus paper of the authenticity of any claims for you to love God. This, this was crucifixion language to the Pharisees, right? These are the most diligent God lovers in the world. Jesus saying to them, the way for you guys to know if you love God is whether you love me. And you don't love me, you want me dead. So you don't know God. That's why I talk to Muslims. Without Jesus, you don't know God. John 14, 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. So my answer to the first question, what's the relationship between love for God and love for Jesus, is this. If somebody in your network of any religion whatsoever says they love God and they don't have the time of day for Jesus, they're not telling the truth. They are either lying or self-deceived. And so I said that on this panel. So it's three, two, two Christians and two uh, Muslim scholars at ETS a few years ago. And I stood up and I read about three or four other texts like that. And I, I looked at them. They're sitting here in the panel like those chairs right there. And I said, so those, those texts, according to the New Testament, says you guys, you Muslims, don't know God, you don't love God, you don't honor God. Just looking right at him. And, and the guy comes up after me and he says, well, I didn't know you were going to be so Christological. 
And then he proceeded to give his talk and gave no response whatsoever. I don't think he'd ever heard anybody say what I just said in public. Anyway, like there's, that, is, that is so clearly there that uh, a Muslim would, would need to say, well, historic Christianity must believe then that we don't have a saving relationship with Allah. We don't, which they don't according to those texts. So that's, that's question number one. Question number two is, what is this love? And how many people have you ever heard say, loving God or loving Jesus is obeying Jesus? Basing it on the text, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That text says the opposite of that. An if-then sentence doesn't say that the then or the if are the same. But if I'm hungry, I'll eat lunch. Doesn't mean hunger is lunch. If you love me, you'll obey. Doesn't mean love is obedience. It means, in fact, it comes before and enables. If you love me, you will obey, but they're not the same. Love goes first, underneath, holding up, staying in the yoke, abiding, enjoying, treasuring, marveling, being entranced by, being filled with. And out of that, a good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. Make the tree good. That's another command that's off later in the book. So my answer to the second question, what is this love, is first, it is not synonymous with obedience. What is it? Well, how about Matthew 6, 24? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love, love the other, or he'll be devoted, devoted to the one and despise the other. What kind of language is that? Hate, love, despise, devotion. That's real heart-laden, emotional, affectional language, right? And that's the way Jesus talked about whether you love God or money. Are you sold out in such a love affair with money and what it can buy that Jesus is not your highest treasure anymore? Or is Jesus so completely satisfying as your highest treasure that money is not in that idolatrous position? Those are your two options. So love in Jesus' talk is not doing, it is treasuring. Did you treasure me above everything? And that brings us back to 1037 of Matthew, right? If you love me less than your mom and dad, if you love your children more than you love me, those are relationships of great. I love my kids. I die for my kids. I, I enjoy my kids. I treasure my kids. That's the talk. That's the language. That's the affectional, emotional dimension. When I was a junior at Wheaton ages ago, 67, it was the fall of 67 or spring, I can't remember which, it was 67. Millard Erickson was my teacher in apologetics and we were reading Joseph Fletcher's Situation Ethics, a very bad book. And, and he knew it was bad and he loved to assign, we, he signed four bad books. And we read them and we we're supposed to critique and he would come into class and play the bad guy. It was, very, it was a very exciting class, I loved it. And uh, Joseph Fletcher argued, love cannot be an emotion. It can only be an action or an act of will. Why? It is commanded. And you can't command the emotions. Turn them on, turn them off, turn them on. They don't work like that. That was the argument. And I can remember, I mean, I'm just a brand new budding theologian. Like, don't know anything. 21 years old. And I grew up in a home where we read the Bible every day and believed it. And one of the glorious things about growing up in a, in a Bible-believing home where you read the Bible every day is that it affects your olfactory, your theological nose. 
So you smell stuff before you can understand how bad it is. Like, <laughs> something's wrong here. <laughs> this smells wrong. And you can't say it. Isn't that wonderful? Because a lot of you are, you know, not theologically educated, but you've got great noses. You walk into a room or something, and they're talking about you. I say, that's not right. <laughs> not right. And they say, what's wrong with it? I say, I'm just not sure. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go study up on it, but I know something's wrong here. So I'm sitting in that class and, what? that's not right. You know what was not right about it? The New Testament commands the emotions everywhere. <laughs> I mean, duh, you can't command the emotions? Give me a break. We're commanded to be grateful. We're commanded to hope. We're commanded to rejoice. We're commanded to be sorrowful and weep. I mean, I mean I've got a list of what, 15 emotions from the New Testament, including Jesus, which God commands, which is why Augustine says, command what you will and give what you command, because premise number three in Fletcher's argument is true. You can't turn them on and off, which is why people think they can't be commanded. It makes us feel helpless. You're commanding me to be happy in Jesus? What do you expect me to do? Kind of start jumping up and down and hope it happens? That's the kind of response you get. No, he expects you to be born again, be a new person. And yes, it's beyond your control. And yes, we are desperate. And yes, we need to pray for revival in America. Nothing we do is going to turn this land around or your church around or your soul around. God will turn it around and we have to ask for miracles, the Spirit to fall on us so that we are changed. So my answer to what is this love? It is a, uh, an affectional treasuring of God above all things, treasuring of Jesus above all things. Third question, where does it come from? How does it arrive? Now, of course, new birth would be one answer, but consciously where does it come from? Remember Luke 7, the story of the woman, the uh, woman of ill repute that the Pharisee knew well was a woman of ill repute. And Jesus is with Simon in his house and he's reclining and he's eating supper. And this woman comes in off the street. Everybody knows the kind of woman she is. She kneels down. She, you know how they ate. So, so here's the table and you stretch your feet out behind you, lean on your elbow and you eat like this. That's the way you do it. And so she's down there at his feet, quietly, crying. And her tears are falling on Jesus' feet. And she pulls her hair down, and she's washing. I mean, this is incredible. This is sexy. This is, this is, what in the, why is he letting her do this? The Pharisee is really upset. And you remember the story that Jesus told him. He said a man had two debtors. One owed him, let's just pick numbers, $50,000, and another owed him $500. And he, he just said to both of them, it's all right, I'll, I'll forgive you this time. Which of them would love him more? That's what he said. Which of them would love him? Word was love. And he said, well, I guess the one he forgave more. And then Jesus looked at him and said, I came into your house. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't kiss, give me a kiss of greeting. This woman has not ceased to cry or wash my feet since I have come. Therefore, it's, it's an interesting kind of argument. Therefore, her sins, which are many, and I'm going to add the words we know, are forgiven. She didn't get forgiveness by washing his feet. That's why you have to be careful here. She didn't earn forgiveness by watching, washing his feet. She showed her forgiveness. Or to reach back up to the word love, she's the woman who just was forgiven $50,000. You, you're not in debt the rest of your life. Your whole university debt has been paid. You are free. And she is so absolutely overwhelmed by the gift of Christ. She loves him more. So one answer to the question is, where does love for Jesus come from? It comes from knowing how much your debt is and what he paid to remove it, right? I mean, think that's what, that's what the, the story says. So if you're walking down a beach and you chip and you stumble 
on the beach and you're, you're getting up and somebody runs up and helps you up, you say thank you and you keep going. Not a lot of love there. Just thank you. You're nice. And you're swimming out about 60 yards and a, an undertow like you never knew was there. It's true. It's just got you under. Your head comes up once, help! Lifeguard on his way, big buoy, swimming, catches you as you are thinking it's over. And he brings you in and you feel something different than the stumble guy. Like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if he died doing that, then it would be even more. Paul, let's go to Paul, said, at the right time, while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. Perhaps for a righteous man one might, scarcely for a righteous man one will die. Perhaps for a good man one might dare to die. But God shows his love for us in the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If then we have been justified while we were enemies, how much more will be saved by his life? The whole, the whole thrust is if we knew, if we knew what it cost Jesus and how undeserving we were, we would love him much. So that's one answer to where it comes from. And the last question about love God and love Jesus is how important is it? Well, Jesus said in 1037, who, Matthew 1037, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So y y you can't have Jesus if you don't love him more. Or here's Paul, 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. That's how important it is. No love for God, hell. It doesn't say, if anyone does not believe in me as Lord, it's love. If anyone does not love the Lord, that's not a series of deeds. That's new birth, heart change that embraces Jesus as our most loved treasure or we perish. No competitors. If he's number two, you're lost. Jesus is radical, but he doesn't put burdens on you that you can't bear. He comes. That's command number two. Number three, we have 11 minutes left, so we're not going to make it all the way through. Love your enemies. This one gets practical, relates to the stuff we were talking about on the panel, so I'm happy to linger here for a little bit. If this is the last one we do, that's okay. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Justice. Justice. That comes from the Old Testament. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Somebody smacks you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. When he sues you to take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. If somebody demands that you go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks. Don't withhold from the one who would borrow from you. End of paragraph. That's the fifth antithesis. Number six, you've heard that it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you so that you will be sons of your Father who is in heaven because he makes his son to rise on the just and the unjust and sends rain on the evil and the good. If you love those who love you, what are you doing more than the tax collectors? If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than the Gentiles? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, here's the interesting thing about those two paragraphs. Those are the last two paragraphs of Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. This one could be summed up with 
Give, 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 no questions asked, even for those who unjustly are taking. That's what it says. Sue you to take your cloak, give me your cloak as well. Demand you go one mile, go with them too. Give to the one who asks. I live downtown, Gloria begs at the corner of 11th Avenue and 17th every day. I know Gloria. Stand there with their cardboard sign. Anything would be helpful. I have to make choices every day like that. I walk by here on the way to church. It's church. Right? This is the good Samaritan type. So that paragraph says, give. This paragraph says, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, which forces you to ask, what are you going to pray? Well, hallowed be your name in their lives. Your kingdom come in their lives. Your will be done in their lives like the angels do it in heaven and meet their daily bread and forgive them for all their sins and keep them out of sin and temptation. That's what you're going to pray for your enemy. Salvation. And every practical need met that can be met. That's why you're going to pray for your enemy. They're good. Okay, now that's different, isn't it? Like, give no questions asked, figure out what their good is, pray for it, and love them practically to bring it about. They don't fit. Many times, those two things don't go together. This is why life is hard. This is why the Christian life is so complex. I'll give you some illustrations of what I mean when I say they don't, they don't fit. Suicidal person. Go to visit them, and they say, I, I just can't take it anymore. I'm pretty sure tonight's the night I'm going to do it. And I would like you to get me the pills. Give me the pills. And give me the freedom. Just leave me alone. Give me the pills. What do you do? You're not going to give it to them. Even though Jesus said, give to the one who asks, do not withhold, you're not going to give it to them. Here's another illustration. Child molester discovered in the nursery at church or maybe as a babysitter in your home. You're arrested, go to visit in the hospital and he asks you for forgiveness. Give me forgiveness. And please give me my job back. And you will give him forgiveness and you will not give him his job back. Even though he asked for it, give to him who asked. A third illustration, a poor person who's got a subsidized apartment down the street, no washing machine, and you watch this single mom lugging heavy laundry loads down to Franklin, over three blocks, to the laundromat, and uh, she has no car, and you say, I'm, I'm going to get her a washing machine. I'm going to save up till I got 700 bucks, and I'm uh, going to talk to the landlord, and we're going to get a washing machine in that place. So she doesn't have to do that. And, and when you get there, we, I mean, when you finally arrive at your 700 savings, you're walking there, and somebody comes up and asks for the money. <laughs> Can I have the money in your pocket. I have lots of needs. They give you stories. Will, which, which will you give? In other words, there are competing demands that contradict each other, and Jesus certainly knew this. Um, one last illustration. Just, do you remember when um, Vody was talking about sphere sovereignty? Um, be interesting. Maybe he'll talk about that tonight. I don't know. Um, but when I heard that, here's some spheres that the Bible deals with. And, and Vody's a Bible-saturated guy. This is part of what he means. I'm thinking of government as a sphere, 
parent and family is a sphere. Uh, economic structures of employment are a sphere. Church is a sphere. In every one of those four spheres, turn the other cheek in the Bible does not work and is not expected. Just illustrate. It says in Romans 13 that the government bears the sword not in vain. It is given to reward the good and to punish the evil. So if a thief smacks a cop on the right cheek, the cop should not turn the left cheek. which creates problems for the cop to be obedient to, to the Sermon on the Mount. Because probably when he goes home, if a neighbor comes up and is ticked at him because he parked his car again in the wrong driveway and hits him, he probably should turn the other cheek and say, I'm sorry, and, and be as conciliatory as he can and be meek and, and deferential. Those are not easy distinctions to make. Or parents. If, your if you say to your child, don't, don't ever say that to your mother again. Don't, don't ever say to her again, shut up. And the kid goes, shut up. <laughs> you don't turn the other cheek. You spank that kid. <laughs> spank, spanking, spanking is not a contradiction of what Jesus meant, but it sure sounds like it. Because in these spheres, another one is economics. So you've got 20 employees, and one of them says, he says, where were you yesterday? He said, I slept in. <laughs> well, we needed you. I know. I won't, I won't do it again. Um, but I'd, I'd, like, I'd like all my wages. You don't have to pay him. If you do not work, you don't eat. That's Bible. Don't work, don't eat. Okay, so those are four illustrations where the teaching of non-resistance are qualified by the Bible, not by me, by the Bible. Spanking is in the Bible. The sword is in the Bible. Don't work, don't eat is in the Bible. Those are all non-turn-the-other-cheek moments. So it is complex to know how to love your enemy because Jesus is saying do what's good for them and uh, Jesus is saying give them whatever they ask. So what is, why did he talk like that? I think he talked like that, give, 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 because there are, there are at least two great obstacles to loving people, loving our enemies. One is we're, we love our stuff. We love our stuff, right? You got a wallet, it's got a five and five ones, and they're saying, can you spare a buck? You want your money. And Jesus says, that, that's not a good motive. You shouldn't want your money that much. That's what that paragraph is about. You love your stuff. You love your stuff. All those commands, I think, give to the one who asks. Somebody asks you to go two miles. These are all, how free are you? How free are you from your stuff? Now, the other paragraph says, love your enemy, pray for him. Over in Luke, it says, do good to the one who abuses you. What is good for Gloria? What's good for the guy named Larry who climbs the fence and lives under the bridge now and then, 50 feet from my house? What's good for them? Good for them is to see a Christian freely giving. And good for them is to hear a Christian stop and talk to them, invite them home for breakfast. I said to Larry one time, it's freezing cold outside. He was climbing the fence out from under the bridge. I knew him. I mean, he's, he pushes his carriage around with the, with, he, he, uh, we just ran out of time, so this will be the last thing. He, pu he pushes the, the um, grocery cart around full of metal. He collects metal. I don't know how he and I said, Larry, it's freezing cold. Come on in. You can use the bathroom here and give yourself for breakfast. And he said, 
I said, all right. It's all right, going over to the hospital. They got bathrooms over there. Larry's a proud man. He's got his lifestyle worked out. But we, we ought to seek to do what's good, sharing the gospel, reaching out, making offers. So we got through three of the six of what Jesus demands from the world. And let me, let me just uh, draw an arc back to the beginning. The main thing I want to help you with is teach them to observe everything I commanded. Teach them to observe. You can't just teach them to know. You must teach them to observe. The way to teach them to observe, I'm arguing, is to put them in touch in union with Jesus Christ through the new birth, through the wonderful commands of come, love, abide, believe, be born, before you get to lay down your life and work hard for the poor. These have to come first. They are the key to teaching people to observe everything he commanded. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I know we only got through a few of these, but I pray that we would take up the gospels and we would love Jesus, listen to Jesus, be thrilled by this person, Jesus, that his death for us, his life for us, his spirit in us would be so completely satisfying that we would be free from craving our stuff and therefore ready both to give and to discern where not to give for the good of others. I ask this in his name. Amen. Thank you.